And notice with me what the Word of God says. Thank you. It says, Wherefore, I will not... What, what are the words? Be negligent. Be negligent to put you always in remembrance. In remembrance of what? Of these things. Though ye know them and be established in... Uh, what are the next three words? In the present truth. Now, one of the words that we would like to focus on here is the word uh, establish. It's the word established that we want to look at here. Now, Peter also mentioned that in the, in the last days, scoffers will come and to uh, speak evil of the messages for this time. As it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in these last days. And this is the reason why, keep a finger there, we'll come back to that. Go to chapter 2 this time. As we read a moment ago in chapter 2, he says... In verse 12, but these are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. What do they do? They speak evil of the things that are, that they what? Understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruptions. Now, we have been given a message for these last days to give to the world. As the remnant people of God, our message is a very pointed message message as sister white says it's a pointed testimony we have been given a message not like the world or i should say the rest of the so-called protestants are preaching out there it's a message to get a people ready for the soon return of jesus we are also told that our testimonies or our messages should be more pointed than that of john the baptist we are also told that the message that we as a people should bear in these last days will cause many of us to be martyred as we read in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter, chapter 11. And this is what we want to discuss in this uh, study today. Present truth. God wants us to be established in the present truth. And as we just read in chapter 2, two verse 12, that there will be evil men coming, speaking evil of the things that they do not understand. As it was in the case of John the Baptist, in the case of Elijah, in the case of Jesus, so will it be in these uh, last days. So God wants us back to chapter 1 again, verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent. To put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Now, the word established, if you look on the screen with me, the word established, it has several definitions, but some of them are on the screen, as you can see, to make what? Stable. Stable. What else? Place firmly. Place firmly. And what else? Set fast and fix. So in other words, if we were to look at this verse one more time, when Peter said to the, his uh, listeners there that he wants them to know these things and to establish in the present truth, in other words, he wants them to be grounded, firmly grounded, to understand where, where we are, to understand what's, what's happening. Present truth has a lot to do with uh, current events. Notice what Sister White says here on the screen. She says, from Review and Herald, April 6, 1905, paragraph 10. We are called upon by God to do what? Present. To present the truth for when? For this time. Workers who can speak to the multitudes are to be located where they can meet the people and give them the what? The warning message. Ministers and canvassers should be on the ground watching their opportunity to present the truth and to hold meetings. Let them be quick to seize opportunities. For what reason? To place present truth before those who know it not. Let them give the message with clearness and power that those who have ears to hear may do what? May hear. This sounds to me like there is an urgency. There was an urgency for the message for this time. Now, again, Peter was talking over 
2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, when he pinned down those words for us. Now, if it was urgent back, back then, how urgent is it for us living in the last days? How urgent is, is it for us living at the, the nails of the image, the toenails of the image of Daniel chapter 2? It should be very, very urgent. And as, again, go back to ch verse chapter 1, verse 13 this time. He says, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle. What's the tabernacle he's referring to here? He's talking about his body. He's talking about himself. To stir you up by doing what? Putting you in remembrance. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. That means he's going to die. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ have showed me. So Peter had an urgency there. There was an urgent matter that needed to be discussed. He wanted to establish them before he put off, as he said, his tabernacle. Before he, he passed away. There was an urgency. He wanted to establish the disciples. Speaking of establish, let's look at Luke with me. Luke chapter 9. Which book are you going to? Let's go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. And we're going to look at a few passages that deals with uh, the definition of the word established there. We're going to compare them as we move along. Chapter 9, verse 51. Are you heading there or are you there? Yeah. Notice the Word of God says, And it came to pass when the time was come that he, the he there is Jesus, he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Which one, which verse, or which word, rather, is associated with the word uh, established there? Which word? Set. Set. Jesus, remember, Jerusalem was the same place where they were seeking for his life. Right. Jerusalem was that same place where it was prophesied that he would uh, meet his death. But the Bible tells me here that Jesus, nevertheless, was, has set his mind, his heart, his eyes to go towards Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Why going there anyway when he understood, when he knew the fate that was awaiting him there? He did that for you and I. He set his mind to save you and I. He established his heart to save you and I, no matter the cost. That was his mission. He knew what was awaiting him in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, he did not look to the right. He did not look to the left. He set his face to go to Jerusalem, to meet his death, to face the mockery, to face the trial. The question is for you today. Are you established on the Word of God? Are you set? Have you settled? Have you set your mind? No matter what happened, no matter what may come your way, and God would allow many things to come your way, are you grounded to say, like Job said, naked I've, uh, what, came into this world. Naked, I'm going to go out. The Lord has done what? The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. And what else? What else? Come on, quote that with me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job had established or set his mind, set his heart, that no matter what calamities befall him, again, he will continue to serve the Lord. He will continue to serve the Lord. So Jesus is our example. Jesus has chosen Jerusalem. When he chose Jerusalem, that means he has chosen the narrow path. He has chosen the, the hard way. He has chosen the only path. This was the only path that would pay for your sins and my sins. It was the only path that would lead us to the heavenly kingdom. Amen. It was the only path that would give you and I hope today. And that is the path that he has chosen. That's the reason why you and I today are sitting here. 
That's the reason why we are congregating here. That's the reason why we have this hope, as the song says. Hope of the coming of the Lord. Hope that he will come as king and king and lord of lords. Hope that one day, soon and very soon, he is going to destroy sin and death. That's the path he has chosen. And that is the path that he is asking each one of us to choose today. And the struggles, the trials, whatever we are going through, it's part of present truth for the moment. That, that is what God wants you to have in these last days. That is what God wants you to have in the moment. That is the path he wants you to follow. As we follow this path, we are developing the characteristics that are needed to enter the heavenly Canaan. Amen. Again, as I mentioned before, some of you may have heard me mention this before. God could have taken the children of Israel to the, the promised land in a short amount of time. There was another path to get to the promised land, but he chose the wilderness. And the wilderness represented a, a ground where character was supposed to be shaped before entering the heavenly Canaan. It was a neutral ground. God had to reveal himself to them in a way that they have never witnessed before so that they can choose either they were going to obey and follow that God or do their own things. I hope and pray that you would choose Jerusalem, symbolically speaking here, that you will choose Jerusalem. Notice with me, go now to the book, well, we're still in the book of Luke, chapter 16 this time. Again, we are looking the word establish in the present truth. Chapter 16. Notice verse 26 with me of chapter 16. Well, let's begin in verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hit not, notice carefully with me, I mean chapter 14 rather, Chapter 14, I'm sorry. Chapter 14, verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not what? His father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yet in his own life also. What would happen to that person? He cannot be my disciples. So what is uh, one of the prerequisites to be a disciple? You have to give up. You have to put God first. You have to give up everything and put God first before anyone and, and everything. This is how our mind should be established. This is how we should be settled in our mind. And by doing so, that, that does not mean the word hate there does not mean hate as if uh, doing evil to somebody else. It means not to love them above God. That's what it means. Not to love anyone or anything above God. And this is what Jesus did for you and I. He was the creator of all things. But yet, with all the beauties around us, in spite of sin in our world, there are still some beauties there. In spite of all the beauties in the universe, in spite of the, all, all, all the beauties, being in the presence of the Father, the holy angels, he left all of these things and he had chosen Jerusalem. Now, let's go to chapter 16 of the same book. Chapter 16, notice. In chapter 16, again, one of the definitions of the word established there. You tell me if you see it. Verse 26, chapter 16, verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a what? A great gulf fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. This was uh, Jesus talking, uh, using uh, an allegory, using uh, this story there of uh, the uh, men called Lazarus who died and uh, went to Abraham bosom. And then you had the rich men who came. And, and, and said, and said what? Do you remember what the rich man said? Can you tell my brethren 
You, you like communicating with the dead? But in Christ said there is a great goal fix. That means establish. That means it's impossible for you, the dead, to communicate with the living. Or the living to communicate with the dead. That's the establishment. You see, that's the definition of the word established there. We need to be grounded in the present truth. Let's look at another one. Still in the same book, chapter 22. Chapter 22 of the book of Luke. This time looking at verse 32. Chapter 22, verse 32. And the Bible says, well, then again, it says, but I have prayed for you. Jesus is talking to Simon. He said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The word strengthen there is the same Greek word as establish. Strengthen. Establish yourself. Strengthen that bre thy brethren. I I again, Romans chapter 1. You are very familiar, I'm sure, to the book of, to that passage we're about to read here. In Romans chapter 1. Which book did I say? Romans chapter 1. And notice with me what, what the Word of God says. In Romans chapter 1, looking at verse 11 of the book of Romans chapter 1. God wants us to do what? To be established in where again? In present truth. Present truth is what the flock needs now. Romans chapter 1, notice what the Bible says in verse 11. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end, ye may be what? What are the words? Established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and uh, me. Establish in what? Establish in what? If you skip on down with me to verse 16, notice, he says, For I am not ashamed. Of the gospel of Christ, for it is what again? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, what, what is therein? Where is therein? Therein is, is, where is therein? In the gospel, very good. In the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? By faith. We need to be established. How? By faith. In uh, the word of God. In uh, the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ. One more passage. Test. We're going to 1 Thessalonians this time. Where are we going to? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Notice with me what the apostle Paul says. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. God wants us to be established. To be firm. To be grounded. In the present truth for this time. Chapter 3, notice verse 13. He says, to the end, he may, what's the word again? Establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So God wants us to be established, where? In our hearts. How? Unblameable in holiness before God. God is coming for a church without what? spot or wrinkle right without blemish without blemishes god wants us to establish now how many of you you don't need to raise your hand how many of you would like to see the second coming of jesus christ witness it Amen. but not be destroyed by the brightness of his coming Amen. because there's the some of the wicked are going to see him too so I, that's why I have to be precise here, right? Some of the wicked are going to see him too. But they will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. But those who have been grounded, established in the word of God, and who have put off the old men, will see him. What would they say? As the prophet tells us, Yea, this is our Lord. We have waited for him. And he will do what? He will save us. First Peter this time. First Peter chapter 5. Go forward to the book of First Peter this time. Chapter 5. Notice what the Apostle Peter says in verse 10. First Peter chapter 5 verse 10. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his what? Eternal. Eternal glory. How? By Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered. For how long? A while. A while. Make you perfect and uh, what else? 
establish, strengthen, settle you. Those two words there go together. It establish and settle. But we must and do what first? Suffer. But for how long? A little while. What we go through on a daily basis cannot compare with the eternal glory, as the Apostle Paul says. God wants his people to be established in the present truth at this time. Notice what Sister White says here on the screen. From early writing, page 63, paragraph 2. There are, what? Many precious truths contained in the Word of God. But what does the flock need? It is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated what's the word to unite the flock and sanctify the soul Satan will here take every possible advantage to endure the cause but such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is. What's the word? Establish the faith of the doubting and give a certainty to the glorious future. Where will that be? The glorious future mentioned here. Talking about the second coming, right? Notice. Back to the screen. These I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the what? The messengers should dwell. The messengers should dwell on what? On present truth. For this time, we were given the book of Daniel and the book of uh, Revelation. And in the book of uh, Daniel, we find uh, many prophecies there that help us to understand where, where we are. In particular, the book of Daniel chapter 2 and also chapter 7 of the book of Daniel. Even chapter, chapter 6 and chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. These prophecies, these stories, like in the case of Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, and even in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, they are there to help us to be established, to be grounded in present truth, to be grounded in Christ Jesus. We were told that prophecies are like light shining before us and help us to see where we are stepping in. We were told both Daniel and Revelation, we were to study the those two books carefully so that we can understand where we are. Notice on the screen again what this says here. Prophecy not only foretells the manner of an object of Christ's coming, but presents tokens by which men are, what are, to, what are the next word? To know when it is near. So as we study Bible prophecy and compare that with uh, current events, which, is, which also has a lot to do with present truth, what would happen? We will know, we will understand where we are. We will understand that the second coming of Jesus Christ is even at the door. Notice the next quote there from Maranatha, Page 150, paragraph 6. Christ had bidden his people. What are the next few words again? Watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. So Christ commanded his people to watch for what? Signs. And as we watch for the signs, as we watch for events that are transpiring, we will understand, we will know where we are, right? We will know that he is even at the door. Now, I mentioned Daniel chapter 2. Go to the book of Daniel chapter 2 with me quickly. Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, again, you know that Daniel was interpreting the, the king's dream. He saw, the king that is, saw this great image, which was composed of different metals. And when we come to the leg, legs of the image, they were made of what again? Do you remember? They were made of iron. But then when we come to the toes of the image, what did 
the king see or Daniel what was his interpretation of that notice with me verse 40 and the fourth kingdom which was the uh, legs of iron which was Rome shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things and as iron and that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron the kingdom shall be what divided but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall be what partly strong and partly broken which part of that kingdom which part of this uh, composite here this mixture here is the strongest part the iron and uh, the iron represented whom again that was pagan Rome but now we are dealing with Rome now in these last days we are dealing with papal Rome so papal Rome will rule the world one more time as it was notice on the screen again if you were to look at based on what we just read in Daniel chapter chapter 2 this is where we are brothers and sisters we are right there in the toenails all of these empires the uh, Babylon Empire the Medes and the Persian the Greek Empire the Roman pagan Rome that is Empire and even the division of Rome we have already witnessed all of these things and we are right there at the toes at the toenails now as God peculiar commandment keeping people we were given a message for this time it was a message of separation it was a message of, message of what separation not a message of unity right it was a message to call a people out of Rome out of papal Rome as we read in Revelation chapter 18 Revelation chapter 18 the Bible says in these last days God wants to establish his people revive his people with a message he wants to pour out his spirit upon his people so that they could preach a message with boldness and power chapter 18 verse 1 and after these things I saw an an another angel an angel represent a messenger right that's what the word angelos Greek means it means a messenger I, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory who is that once again who is that messenger well, primarily this is referring to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit right the latter rain but it's also referring to you and I God wants to pour his spirit on you on me to enlighten the world with the glory of Jesus Christ to help the world to see the madness that is that has been going on for the past 6,000 years to help the world see the deception God has called a people to be separated this is a message that we as a people cannot proclaim to the world if we are in unity with the world because notice what the following verse says and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations how many nations all, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication and the king kings rather of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of the delicacies how many people or organizations that are not with Babylon here how many how many that are not with Babylon all of them are with Babylon the kings of the earth the merchants of the earth all of them are with Babylon and if you go we don't have time to go to that but chapter 17 it also describe 
the churches are with Babylon. Mentioned the daughters, women represent the church, and we have women there, even the churches. And as we also go to Revelation chapter 13, it says, after the deadly wound was healed, the whole earth wandered and followed after the beast. So then who will preach that message against Babylon? Babylon wants to unite the whole world into one, as it was during the time of pagan Rome, as it was during the time of uh, the 1260 years, with, I'm referring to the Dark Ages. This is what Revelation chapter 13 describes that would happen again. Notice with me on the screen. This says here from Fox News, January 11th, or yes, January 11th, 2019. Germany admits EU is already building a what? What's the word? A united army thanks to France. Now, who's behind this unity? Bringing the nations together. What did we just read in Daniel? They will try to mingle together. But they won't be able to stick together. Because as you see, iron they cannot mix with clay. They will mingle with the sin of man. What does that mean? Church and state. Speaking of miry clay. You have the church and the state combined. What does the Bible call this when the church and the state combine together? Image of the beast. That's Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. Back to the screen. It says, Germany's defense minister has revealed a controversial European joint army is, what are the words? Already sh taking shape. Thanks to her French allies, Germany and France are now the driving forces in uh, European defense. And they would stand together in the face of any land assault. The politician also hit back at those who criticize uh, the European Union's PESCO defense scheme, where national military leaders pledge to cooperate with each other. PESCO, which stands for Permanent Structured Cooperation, involves how many? 25 armies working alongside each other. As the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13, uh, go there, Revelation chapter 13, when you have these nations coming together, forming this uh, army, who are they going to fight? That's a good question, right? Who are they going to fight? The remnant of the seed of the woman. That's the target. Revelation chapter 13 says, notice, it says, in verse 4, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And all of these nations are gathering under whose umbrella? Immunity under whose umbrella? Under that beast. So therefore, the question was asked, Who is able to make war against the beast? Notice with me what Sister White says here on the screen. Testimony for the Church, Volume 7, page 182. The world is filled with storm and war and variance. Yet, notice carefully, under one head, who's that head? The papal power. The people will unite to, to do what? To oppose God in the person of his witnesses. So as these nations are coming together, who's the target? Who are they going to fight against? God's people. Back to the screen. Notice, this union is cemented by the great apostate while he seeks to unite his agents in warring against the truth. He will work to divide and scatter its uh, advocates. As I mentioned, as the Bible mentioned rather, we just read it in Revelation chapter 18, the kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, and Revelation chapter 17 mentioned even the churches are coming together in unity. So those who have not joined this unity, this union with the beast, they are the target. They will be the target. Notice, back to the screen. It says here, from pulpit and pen, Baptists join. Baptists have done what? Join with Pope for the sake of what? Christian unity. 
December 28, 2018, the second meeting of the third phase of international ecumenical conversations between the Baptist World Alliance and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Promoting Christian Unity. Who's at the head of this promotion? Who's promoting this? It's, it's the papacy. It's Rome. Notice, now we go to Finland from the Catholic Herald. Headline says, despite being overwhelmingly Lutheran, Finland has opened its heart to whom? Catholicism. To Catholicism. Notice, the Reformation in Finland was a fairly slow and smooth transition from Catholicism to Lutheranism. At the same time, notice carefully, anti-Catholic sentiments were commonly expressed in Lutheran hymns and literature. That's what they used to believe. That's what they used to sing. Notice, the Pope was seen as the Antichrist, and Jesuits were viewed with great suspicion owing to their role in the Catholic Reformation. A significant change, notice not a significant change, in the climate of Finnish Lutheranism took place in the 1960s, thanks to the what? Second Vatican Council. What happened there? It was a movement, meetings that were put together by the Vatican on how to infiltrate the Protestant churches. Amen. Notice, same article went on to say. Today, Finnish Lutheran pastors routinely refer to the Catholic as a what? Mother as a mother church. And uh, the recent Finnish Catholic Lutheran dialogue report Communion in growth records are in an astonishing degree of uh, agreement on traditionally divisive doctrinal issues. Although Finns have sometimes called their country the most Lutheran in the world, they also rightly regard it as a model of ecumenism. Does that mean there's no more Protestants? Does that mean that is the end or the death of Protestantism? Now, this month, month of January. This is the month where this again derived from Catholicism since 1908 where they have been trying to bring all the religions together under one umbrella, the papacy's umbrella. And they call this month, even right now, as we are congregating here, they are meeting in what they call the week of uh, week of prayer for Christian unity. They are meeting as we speak right now. Notice what this headline says. From the premier, week of prayer for Christian unity on the way. That's January 19, 2019. Churches worldwide are praying specifically for what? Christian unity between denominations. So you have all of these churches, again, keep that in mind, all of these churches worldwide coming together for what? Praying for Christian unity. Now, question now. Can you have unity with Rome? No. Can you have unity with Rome? No. What does the apostle say? Apostle Paul. Can we have communion with light and darkness? No. With ba Belial and, and Jesus? No. no. Notice. It says here. This is from Vatican News. January 16, 2019, Pope Francis says Christian unity is what? Is not optional. Who's saying this? The Pope. Then it says, Pope Francis has appealed to Christians across the world to pray and to work for full Christian unity. Ecumenism is not something optional. Again, this year, we are called to pray so that all Christians may once again be a single family according to God's will so that they may all be one. The Bible tells me in John 17, 17, who can quote that? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? Is truth. Is there truth in this unity? No, it is not sanctified by the word of God. So therefore, as a remnant people of God, we cannot be partakers of that kind of unity. 
Because this is a unity not under God, not directed by God. This is a unity under the Roman power, yeah. under Rome. Back to the screen. Notice. Again, the annual week of prayer for Christian unity is a time in which Christians are reminded of Jesus' prayer for his disciples that they may be one so that the world may believe. Now, when Christ said this in the book of John chapter 17, verse 2, that the disciples may be one, what did Jesus include the religious leaders who rejected him? Did Jesus, who was Jesus talking to? Or talking about he was referring to to those who have forsaken all who have made sacrifices to follow him the only way the truth and the life again the disciples were called to be separated when Jesus came in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 it says that he went to the temple to Nazareth where he was brought up he went to the regular line in those days. He went to the church, the established church in those days. And he presented himself as the Messiah. But they almost threw him off a cliff. Then after that, the Bible says, because they rejected him, he went about to find 12. It was after that rejection, he went about to find some to do the work. Thank God he did not go back home. After the rejection. Thank God he was still thinking about me. He was still thinking about you. And when he would go about to find uh, others. He called them. To forsake all. To follow him. Yeah. You cannot serve God. And serve, serve mammoth at the same time. You will never be established in the truth. You will never be grounded. The time is coming and is right upon us just like the disciples when Peter said to Christ look we have forsaken all to follow you what will we have then the time is coming and is right upon us when you and I are going to have to do likewise in order for us to be established to stand fast because if we are not taking the opportunity to stand fast, to be grounded right now. While we have the freedom to do so, what makes you think that when things get even harder, that you would be willing to forsake all for Jesus? What makes you think that you will be willing to shun family members, even church members, who are not willing to stand fast for the truth? You have to be willing to forsake all so that you can be established. The Pope, Rome, is calling the world once again into full unity. Whether if it's the merchants of the world, the nations, the religions, he's calling them all to be in one. And Revelation chapter 12, the second part of Revelation chapter 12, where the Bible says, remember, Revelation chapter 12 speaks of two persecutions. The first one was a persecution that the Waldensians experienced during the papacy supremacy. And then the second persecution that we find, which we read about in verse 16, uh, 17 rather, of chapter 12. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony? It's a spirit of prophecy. Let's go deeper. What is a testimony? What does the word testimony mean? A witness. Now, let's go deeper. What does the word witness mean? It means a martyr. If you look at the Greek word, it means to be a martyr. So God has called us. When, if you remember Matthew 24, verse 14, after Jesus described things that will transpire Wars, rumors of wars, calamities, persecution. Then he says in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in through all the world as a witness. When John said in Revelation chapter 1 that he was on the Isle of Patmos 
for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The word testimony is witness. As a martyr, he was also referring to. That's what the word means. Testimony, witness, it means a martyr. Being willing to die for the truth's sake. Being willing to be crucified for the truth's sake. And not join this uh, unification, this unity that they are calling for. Back to the screen. Now from Cook's magazine, a Catholic magazine. Pope says, notice carefully, he's dealing with the same issue of unity. Pope says it's grave sin to do what? Let's go back. He said, Pope says it's grave sin to deny God has blessed other Christians. He's talking about the Christian unity. It's a sin, he said, if you do not want to join this movement. The prayer service marked the beginning of the week of prayer for Christian unity. The theme for 2019, justice only, justice shall you pursue. When society is no longer based on the principle of solidarity and the, uh, what are the three words there? And the uh, common good. Who knows what the common good, the phrase, the expression, common goods, common goods are. Here it is, from their own writings, the Catholic writing. From their catechism, which what they call third commandment. In respecting religious liberty, and uh, what are the words again? The common good of all. Christians should seek recognition of which day? Sundays. Sundays. And the church holy days as legal holidays. So when the Pope said it's a sin if you do not join this Christian unity movement, and what's behind it? It's the common good. What is the common good? It's Sunday law. Do you see the mark of the beast? Do you see Revelation 13 verses 15 through 17 there? It's, it's the common good. Now, Again, should we as a people who believe in the seventh day Sabbath, who believe that the mark of the beast is not any other day of the week, as uh, Elder Ted Wilson tells us, the mark of the beast is what? It's Sunday. Sunday. It's not any other day of the week. It's not a mark of the beast. It's the mark of the beast. It's Sunday. As a people who believe in the proclamation of the three angels' messages, and more specifically, the third angel's message, righteousness by faith, calling our people out of Babylon, should we join this movement of unity with Babylon? How can you call a people out of Babylon and yet in unity with Babylon? That's, that is an oxymoron. Notice, back to the screen. This here is from the Vatican.va, Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. This is the international version of the text for, of the week of prayer 2019. Justice and only justice you shall pursue, based on Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20. Jointly prepared and published by who? By the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Now, right off the bat, it tells you who's behind this. It's Rome. Then it says, the Commission on Faith and Order of the World Council of Churches. And who was one of the church represented there? The Seventh-day Adventists. Notice another one here. This is from the Westminster United Church. Dealing with the 2019 week of prayer again for Christian unity services. There's a list there of uh, the services the dates, when they will take place, and which church you also see there among with the John's Lutheran Church, the St. Andrew's Anglican Church, with the Westminster United Church, the second church there, the Seventh-day Adventists. Wow. Again, back to the screen. This is from the Indian Catholic Matters, January 18 through 25. Week of prayer for what again? Christian unity. Let's quote this. If we Christians take a look at our history, we will be saddened to see that it has often been a succession of... What are the words there? Read that with me carefully. What has been a misunderstanding? Notice, they're referring to the Dark Ages. They're referring to the persecutions that took place. We were, we, we were persecuting each other. Notice, back to the screen. 
quarrels and conflicts. Certainly, it was due to historical, cultural, political, geographical, and so social circumstances, but also because Christians were lacking in what is their specific unifying future. So what is the reason for this unity? It's not because of this uh, apostolic or apostate church who is against the commandments of God, and as Daniel chapter 7 says, who has taught to change times and law, but it's because we didn't have uh, love for one another. That's what this just said. Notice. The presence of Jesus, therefore, between a Catholic and an evangelical who live mutual love, between an Anglican and an Orthodox, between an Armenian and a Reformed Christian, how much peace it would bring even now, how much light it would provide or generate for a productive ecumenical journey. Same article goes on to say, let's join all initiatives of prayer services for Christian unity during this week and seek to increase our love for those Christians who belong to a church that is different from ours. And here is the list there. Who is there as well? January 21st, the red words there in the middle. Who is there? Who, have, who has accepted this quote-unquote misunderstanding? The Seventh-day Adventist Church as well. So the Reformation was just a misunderstanding. When Martin Luther stood up and nailed those 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg because of the teachings, the errors of Rome, this was a misunderstanding. When men like John Huss and many others gave up their life at the stake, they were burned at the stake, this was a misunderstanding. But this, back to the screen, this is not a misunderstanding. You have the Adventist church over there in Florida at the Adventist hospital promoting what? Halloween. They are promoting Halloween. And there are a lot of other things that I've covered. I don't want to take the time to, to cover this. Now, brothers and sisters, here's the point here. God wants you and I to be established in what again? In present truth. The Bible says, believe not every spirit, but do what? Try, Try the spirit to know whether it be of God. Amen. The established church will not save you. It was the established church. I'm speaking of the regular line of seven Adventists. It was the established church or the establishment that crucified Christ, that turned Christ over to the Romans. What happened then? is about to happen again. Why? Because they are in unity with Rome. They are in unity with Rome. And this has been taking place for a long time now. Notice what Sister White says here on the screen. Actually, this was not Sister White. This is from Joseph Bates. Speaking of uh, the Laodicean church. Notice what Joseph Bates says. In all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. God says he will bring the third part through the fire and we find them. I wonder who is the third part there? Who is the third part? Church. Which church? Do you understand that there were two churches during the time of Christ? You had the established church and the self-supported church. You had the established church and the self-supported church. Like as it was then, so will it be in the, t in the last days. Notice. Then it says, They shall call upon him, and he will hear them. He will say, It is my people. And they shall say, The Lord is my God. First part. Who is the first part? Sardis, the nominal church of Babylon. Second part. Laodicea, the nominal Adventist. The third part. Who is the third part? Philadelphia. The only true church of God on earth. Why? Why uh, Philadelphia was the only or supposed to be or is the only true church? Why? Notice, for they ask to be what? Translated to the city of God. In order to be translated, what must take place first? Transformation of heart. Transformation of, of character. 
we must be established. But the church is very proud in uh, saying that, or proud in, in saying that they are the Laodicean. God never intended for us to be in this Laodicean state. No. We started out as the, as the Philadelphia church, brotherly love church. But sadly, we have lost our first love. Let's finish the quote. In the name of Jesus, I exhort you again to what? To flee from the Laodiceans as from Sodom and Gomorrah. Their teachings are false and delusive and, and lead to utter destruction. Death, death, eternal death is on their track. Remember who? That's wife. That's wife. So what's the counsel? To flee the Laodicean condition, which is where we are. To flee that. Notice, back to the screen again. Sister White says, from Manuscript Releases 211, she says, many souls will come, notice, from other denominational churches. And at which hour? At the 11th hour, will obey. They will do what? They will obey all the truth because they have not set themselves in array against heaven's light, but lived up to all the light they had. While those who have had great light, who is that group there? Seventh-day Adventists. While those who have had great light, large privileges, and our opportunities and have failed to live in the light and walk in the light will drop out by the way. Their light will shine less and less until their lamps will go out for the want of the oil of grace in their vessels with what? With their lamps. Now this is again talking about the corporate church, but it also has a personal application to you and I. As we're coming to a close, brothers and sisters, go to the book of 2 Thessalonians with me as we're coming to a, a close. Which book we're going to? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to. God wants us to be established in what again? In, in the present truth. And if you are attending a church where you are not being aware of Bible prophecies, what's taking place, you need to talk to the pastor, to the leaders, whoever it is. I need to be grounded here. I need to understand what's happening. Because the Bible says in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. Who can quote that? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because they have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. God wants his people to know what's, what's going on. The church needs to be fed with present truth. This is what the flock needs now. Notice in 2 Thessalonians, we're going to. Chapter 3, I mentioned. Notice verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. But the Lord is what? Is faithful. Who shall, what's the word again? Establish you and keep you from what? From all evil. The Lord is faithful. He will grant us. He will establish us. He will keep us from the grip of the enemy. Even if we have to give up our lives. And the Christian blood is compared to what again? Seed. And what does a seed do? When you plant it, it goes into the ground, shoots up root, and then it grows. That means when you give up your life for the sake of the truth, you remain grounded and planted. You are also saving the lives of somebody else. You are also helping somebody else to come to know our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. You know where you were before you had accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know the hope that is burning in your heart at this moment. The hope of a coming of the Lord. You know, at least you should know, I should know, that no matter what I'm going through right now, I have hope, I have a future, I have a better day. But there are many out there 
who do not have that hope or who do not understand it. They need to see it in you. They need to see it in us. This is why the Bible says in Revelation 18, 1 again, that when that angel comes, the earth was lightened with his glory. And that glory is the manifestation of the character of our loving Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Loving Father, which art in heaven, thank you again for the word of life, word of truth, word of hope. I thank you, Father, in a special way for the men and women who came before us, who have sacrificed so much to preserve uh, these words that we just finished feasting on. I pray, Father, that when our time comes, and it will surely come, that we will stand fast and firm and grounded in your word so that we too may be a living testimony, a witness, not only unto thee, but unto others. And as we also read from the book Christians, uh, Fox, uh, Christian Martyrs, Foxes of Martyrs, many who came, many who were taken to the Colosseum, those who came for the entertainment to watch these Christians being slaughtered, they came there to enjoy the entertainment, but as they saw the countenances, their countenances, as they saw their faces, as they heard them singing praises unto thy name, as they were being devoured by wild animals, many from the audience surrender their lives to you. Help us, Father, to do likewise, no matter what happened. In Jesus' name, amen.